morning. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel 12. It's a lengthy passage, but hopefully we will get through it on time. And if not, you can wait on lunch. Take a look. <laughs> chapter 12, this is the Word of God. Then Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice and all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you. Now here is the king walking before you, but I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am. Bear witness against me before the Lord and His anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed, or from, whom, from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. And they said, You have not defrauded us, or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. He said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and His anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. And they said, He is witness. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. So now take your stand, that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which He did for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, so He sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jeroboam and Bedon and Jephthah, Samuel, and delivered you from the hand of your enemies all around so that you lived in security. Then, or rather, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammon, came against you, you said to me, No but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you have asked for. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and listen to his voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you, as it was against your fathers. Even now, take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that He may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord." And Samuel, then all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have committed all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon His people on account of His great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for Himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only serve the, or rather fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things He has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be wept away. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word in our time this morning. Shall we pray? I will never, ever forget that spring day in the year of 02. My wife and I had moved back to Dallas, me to go to Dallas Theological Seminary, and coming to Believer's Chapel, it was a breath of fresh air, wonderful doctrine, wonderful folks, getting involved in this amazing body. 
We were living actually in Deep Ellum, actually living in a basement uh, of, of a building called Adam Hats. It's an old one. It's been there a long time. And we had to store some of our, uh, well, it was a very, very small place in the basement. So we had to store much of our uh, stuff, if you will, in a storage facility. It was just two blocks away. So Saturday morning, my wife and I jump in the car to get a couple of items there. And uh, as I put the car in drive and start to drive off, my wife looks and she goes, you're not wearing your seatbelt. And um, I said, I know. And being a uh, American who loves freedom, I still wasn't over that 17-year-old Texas rule that says we have to wear seatbelts in the car. And I said, it's just two blocks. And she said, yeah, I, I wish you'd put it on. And I said, I'm fine. And uh, my wife said, okay. So we drive the two blocks, I think it was about, I don't know, 20 seconds, and pulled up to the uh, parking lot at the public storage. And as I'm about to get out of the car, I notice blue lights <laughs> behind me. So me being not only a freedom-loving American, but also a um, conscientious, rule-abiding at the very moment, roll down the window, put my hands on the 10 and two, and the officer comes up and he said, sir, do you know why I pulled you over today? And the rest is history, as you can imagine. Um, I, my wife likes to say that was the best $200 we ever spent. <laughs> and ultimately the way it worked is I didn't want to obey. I don't like government telling me what to do, but not only that, it was, it fit within the purview of Romans 13. I should wear a seatbelt. But I wouldn't obey until it was painful. And I didn't want to do it. And it wasn't going to happen until it became painful. Now, I would love to say that's the only time that occurred. In a small town in Oklahoma, they actually enforced those laws as well. The only problem within a small town in Oklahoma, they like to uh, put your name in the paper when you get a ticket. <laughs> And one of the elders there happened to be a former highway patrolman. And he had great fun with us. Ultimately, it hasn't happened again. But it's interesting to note because the story is going on with Israel today. They don't want to obey until it hurts. And today, it's going to hurt. I'd love to say that they never disobeyed again. But they certainly did. And this was rank rebellion, as we'll see today. So let me give you a rough outline if you're into those sort of things. Uh, what we're going to see is three things are taking place. In verses 1 through 12, the people will be accused. The people are accused. Verses 13 through 18, the people are warned. And verses 19 through 25, the people are encouraged. So uh, by way of background, uh, you have to actually go back to chapter 8, and we're not going to spend time there today, but I'll just give you a rough idea of what's going on. Israel, they go to Samuel and they demand a king. They demand it. And the question we have to ask ourselves before we go any further, was it wrong to ask God for a king? To go to Samuel and say, would you give us a king? Was it wrong? I mean, keep in mind, God told Abraham, kings will come forth from you. Genesis 49, Jacob prophesies about a coming kingly line. And then in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 through 20, we find out what the king is supposed to do and not do. He's not supposed to collect horses, wives, gold. He's supposed to keep and write a personal copy of the law of God he keeps with him. So obviously kings were part of God's plan all along. Well, what did they do wrong in 1 Samuel 8? Well, they come to Samuel and says, You're old, and your sons who help you judge are wicked. And what they're telling Samuel is not the real reason. That's actually the more secondary or even tertiary reason. And one of those reasons is not even, does not even hold weight, as we'll see. No, ultimately, the real reason is they want to be like all the other nations. And ultimately, they don't want God as their king anymore. They don't want him as their king anymore. In 1 Samuel 11, we have the story of Nahash the Ammonite who attacks Israel, giving them thus another reason to want a king. And so what's happening in 1 Samuel 12 is the Lord... Um, is chosen King Saul, and he's going to publicly confirm him through the prophet Samuel. 
It's interesting to note is that although the Lord chose him, he did not chose that king for himself. That will be 1 Samuel 16, where he will send Samuel to yet another person, a young man, the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for he says, I have selected a king for myself among his sons. This one's mine. It's not that Saul wasn't his as well, but the one he particularly wanted was David. Saul was the one that the people asked for. So Samuel explains Israel's future relationship with the Lord and the law, since basically they've demanded to have a king and they have rejected the Lord and they have rejected Samuel as well. One note before we go into our text. Interesting, Samuel is not only a prophet, but he's also a judge. And get this, he's the only judge that went into a forced retirement. And he was the best judge Israel ever had. Isn't that like wicked man? Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Then Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice and all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you. Now here is the king walking before you, but I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. And I have walk, walked before from my youth even to this day. So what's happening here is, remember chapter 8, they said Samuel needs to be replaced. And Samuel right here is going to defend himself and his ministry. He's going to tell them a few things. First thing he's going to say, I've listened to your voice. I did what you asked. In 1 Samuel 8, verse 16, he's going to say, a king will never say that. <laughs> a king's not going to listen to you. He's going to make his own call. And so it's almost like he's juxtaposing himself with the king here. And he says, I did what you said to do. Number two, he says, I'm old and gray. Now they said he's too old. He admits to age, but not, but not for being too old. Remember, there is typically wisdom with age. Proverbs 16, 31, a gray head is a crown of glory. It's found in the way of righteousness. Typically, that is the case. And that is certainly true of Samuel. But know what he says. He says, my sons are with you. That's interesting. His two sons, Joel and Abijah, in 1 Samuel 8, the Bible says that they took bribes and they perverted justice. Y'all might remember the story of Eli. He also had two sons, and they were also wicked. And uh, some have said, well, maybe Samuel is just like Eli. I'm telling you, he's not. He's not. Uh, Samuel gets revelation firsthand. Doesn't seem to happen ever to Eli. The Philistines win under Samuel. Samuel's a man of prayer. He's a decisive leader. As I said before, he is the best judge. And it's interesting, the text doesn't rebuke Samuel's parenting one bit. But the fact is, Samuel does have some wicked sons. And so what does he do? Well, you remember perhaps with Eli, he doesn't remove his sons from office. They keep serving in those positions, even as they are committing their wicked acts. Not with Samuel. Uh, it, the text seems to be saying here, my sons are with you. Thus, my sons are no longer with me, helping judge the country. Unlike Eli, Samuel has removed his wicked sons from office. What a man. What a man Samuel is. He fires his own sons. He chooses the Lord even over his own family. Who does that kind of thing? Samuel. And we'll see another young man who does that later in the person of King Saul's son, Jonathan. He encloses with verse 2, I've walked before you from my youth. That means I've shepherded y'all since I was a young man. I've led you. Verse 3, here I am. Bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. When he says, here I am, he's basically putting himself on trial first. Before I put y'all on trial, let me stand up to the box here. And he says, take a look at my ministry. I never stole, I never defrauded, oppressed, took bribes. And by the way, he says in 1 Kings 8, 16, this is what kings do. And I'm not doing that. It reminds me a little bit of Moses in number 16, the story of the Korah's rebellion. Uh, the, Korah, the sons of Korah come to Moses and says, you have, come, you have gone too far by claiming the priesthood. Moses didn't claim the priesthood. It was his brother who was the high priest. 
uh, and this was under uh, direction of the Lord. What's interesting, Moses' response to them, you have gone too far. You think I've gone too far? You've gone too far. And not only that, he, re- he tells the Lord in verse 15, I have not taken one donkey from them. I have not harmed one of them. This is what happens sometimes to Christian leaders uh, is you're going to get nailed for things you haven't even done. As a matter of fact, you were doing just the opposite. This happened with Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says in chapter 4, When I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I, was, I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. So he defends himself. So the question is, why is Samuel defending himself? Does he, is it pride? Is he worried about his legacy? No. Samuel's trying to make people, the, the people of Israel see their sin. It's like he's looking at them and saying, you need to admit you had no reason to reject me and no reason to ask for a king. This is rebellion, is what he's trying to get them to admit to. Note their response, verse 4 and 5. You have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. He said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and His anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. And they said, He is witness. And so it's like Samuel's looking at them and saying, So, I guess what you're saying is I'm not guilty. And so by inference, you're guilty. And you're guilty of demanding a king and you're demanding my resignation. And really what it comes down to is he's going to show them this is rank rebellion. Don't kid yourselves and say, oh, you're just old. No, this is rebellion. You didn't want to follow the Lord anymore. You wanted a man. Verse 6 and 7, Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. So now take your stand that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which He did for you and your fathers. What's happening here is He's giving them historical evidence and He's reviewing God's faithfulness to Israel in spite of their terrible unfaithfulness. And He's reminding them the importance, ladies and gentlemen, of reminding what the Lord has done in your life. So important. The Bible says it over and over. Remember, remember. Note what Spurgeon has to say about this. He says, A remembrance of past mercies is very profitable to us. National mercies ought not to be forgotten, and personal favors should always be fresh in our memory. Alas, the old proverb is only too true. Quote, Bread that is eaten is soon forgotten. So it is even with the bread which God gives us. We eat it, yet soon forget the hand that fed us. Let, us not, let it not be so with us. Uh, There's an Irish singer that came up with a song that he called Eaten Bread is Soon Forgotten. I myself had not heard of that phrase before. Maybe some of you have. But the idea is this. God continuously gives you bread every day. The problem is once you eat it, you've forgotten and you move on to what he hasn't done for you yet. It's like we are perpetual spoiled teenagers. And that's what Israel was guilty of as well. And so God's going to remind him all the good things the Lord has done for you. Verse 8 through 10. When Jacob went into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God. So he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. They fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies and we will serve you. What's happening here is he's giving you kind of a broad brush uh, view of the book of Judges. If you know Judges, it's a very disgruntling sort of book. But hopefully, if you're seeing it right, perhaps it's reminding you of yourself, like it reminds me of myself. And the way it works is like this, is the cycle is they're serving the Lord at first, and then they fall into sin and idolatry, and then they are enslaved, and then they cry out to the Lord, and then God raises up a judge, and then they are delivered. And then they serve the Lord, and they fall back. It just goes around and around, over and over again. 
So the Lord in his kindness to Israel, did you catch some of these phrases? We'll just mention one in particular. It says, he sold them into the hand of Sisera. This was the time when they were ruled by the Canaanites. Uh, and it's interesting, that phrase, sold. Uh, when you sell something, what is it? it? It belongs to you. It's yours. You can do with it what you want. In the concept of selling, you are actually selling it for a price and you're going to get something out of this. And thus the same way with the Lord. When Israel found themselves in these sort of crises, they have to remember that the Lord owns them. And He's not going to let them forget Him because that was the issue. Did you catch it? It says that they soon forgot the Lord, so He sold them. You see, the Lord loves us so much, He is not willing for us to forget Him and move on to other idols. He's out for their good and He's out for ours as well. Although I will tell you, as you know it as a believer that has been disciplined, the process of slavery is not fun. And the Lord ultimately, He is ours forever and we are His. But there are times that we, He disciplines us and we hate it. But it causes us to come back to Him by the grace of Christ. Verse 11 and 12, Then the Lord sent Jeroboam and, and Bedon and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered us rather delivered you from the hand of your enemies all around, so that they lived in security. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us. Although the Lord your God was your king. We'll talk about that in a moment. You see these names, Jeroboam, that's, that's Gideon. He's called that from Genesis 6, one who contends with Baal. Then you have this name, Bedon, and you go, what is, what is that? I don't remember that name ever. Well, I don't either. Um, interestingly enough, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, translate that, that as Barak, and that's probably correct, or Baruch, as you might know it. Um, so that's one of the famous judges. He and Deborah work together. He says, but when you saw Nahash, it's almost like something flipped. You would always cry out to the Lord, and then you saw Nahash and something flipped. You didn't cry out to the Lord. You demand a king. So what is Samuel doing? He's turning the tables, and he's saying, the problem is you. The problem is you. Samuel's saying, you, have no, you had no reason to reject me, no reason to reject the Lord. And so once again, he's trying to seek to lead them to repentance by pointing out their sin, to showing them a mirror. You see, Samuel knows something that too many times we can forget. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he, he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. It's like Samuel is telling them, okay, you people need to quit concealing. You know what you've done. You need to admit to it. Too many times we find ourselves in that same situation. I don't like to apologize. Have you ever met somebody that goes, I, don't, I just don't apologize? The sign of wickedness. No. He's saying it is time. It is past time for you people to admit to this. And they're not doing it. So now he goes from accusing to warning. Verse 13 through 18. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you've asked for. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. So he's telling them the era of the judges is officially over. It's done. The die is cast. Now I'm going to give you two paths you can walk in. Verse 14 is one path. Verse 15 is the second. Verse 14, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and listen to his voice, i.e. obey, and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. Samuel's telling them, this is this, even though you now have a king, even though God is displeased with the, the choice you made, you have the same God, it's the same Mosaic law that still rules Israel. Just because you rebelled the, against the Lord does not mean you have to stay on this path of rebellion. Have you heard people say before that have caught themselves up in drugs, or some sort of rank disobedience, they will say, this is just the way I am. This is just the way I, I cannot change. The Bible's not calling them to that. The Bible's calling them to obedience. He's not going through, can you change? Can you not change? He's just saying, you have to change. 
And this is the way to do it. Now, ultimately, we know only the Lord can cause change. And yet we ourselves are still full on responsible. I'm not going to explain that because the Bible doesn't. God is sovereign and you're responsible. Continuing on, that's one way you can take. Verse 15 is another direction. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. So he's saying, you're going to be just like your fathers. Don't do it. You know, it's interesting. Every generation, and including my own, thinks that theirs is the best. Ours is the best one yet. It's that just simply the pride of man. Uh, we see it, sadly, from even new generations of evangelicals. They may not be guilty of the sin of racism, perhaps, of past generations, but instead they're guilty of another ism called syncretism, where you merge evangelical Christianity with false beliefs, such as social justice, which is so bizarre because too many evil men are leading in this uh, outfit. And the Bible is very clear about this. Proverbs 28.5, evil men do not understand justice. Indeed, they cannot. But those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Not perfectly, but certainly. When it comes to an issue of justice, you trust the believer, the one who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, the maker of justice. So you got two paths. What are you going to take? Well, before he goes further, he's, he's already confronted Israel about this in chapter 8 and chapter 11. So you're actually seeing the third time that he has confronted them, but they still don't get it. And then this time, by God's grace alone, something is different. Verse 16 through 18. Even now, Samuel says, take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that He may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. What's happening here? Well, this is the wheat harvest. Wheat harvest was May, June. In Israel, that is the beginning of the dry season. No rain. In Deuteronomy 28, it lines out that many times God would bless the people through rain. This is not one of those times. As a matter of fact, if it pours down raining in May and June, then your wheat crops are destroyed. You have nothing left. It's almost like God is making it clear to them, as one of the commentators says, you are completely in the hand of God. Lest you forgot in your rebellion, you are completely in the hand of God. Of God. So, when if it rains this time and thunders, which it is in this passage, uh, if it pours, your wheat crops will be destroyed. And not only that, we see that this storm is a sign. It's a sign that the people have sinned. It's a sign that the Lord was with Samuel. And it's a sign of their potential future judgment because they have rejected the Lord. Finally, verses 19 through 25, the people encouraged then all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord our, your God, so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking ourselves for a king. For the first time, the people realized the depth of their sin. There's a Presbyterian commentator that, named Dale Davis that writes this, Only when God's people see their sin from God's perspective is there hope that they will turn away from it. Seeing sin from God's perspective. I think ultimately what we're seeing take place here is repentance. But I would note this, many times repentance begins in the form of fear. Matthew Henry puts it this way, some people will not be brought to a sight of their sins by any other gentler methods than storms and thunders. Can we now relate to that in our own lives? where the Lord brought storms and thunders, and we begin to fear greatly, and the Lord brings us into repentance. I, I think it's fascinating because in chapters 8 through 11, they've constantly been reaching out to 
Saul, and they love Saul, and that's the one they wanted. They don't want anything to do with Samuel. But note, now they're looking to the man of God. They're scared. So the question you should ask yourselves, is, and I, as often I've heard, isn't it wrong to motivate through fear? I mean, isn't that wrong? Don't you always want to motivate through the love of Christ? And certainly that's the, that's the first step we take, yes. But isn't that wrong? Well, I'll quote George Whitfield at this point. He says this, It is a poor sermon that gives no offense, that neither makes the hearer displeased with himself nor with the preacher. So you may be displeased by my answer, but I think the answer is biblical. Question we should ask ourselves, why did Paul write Colossians 3, 6 after Colossians 3, 5? As one of the commentators said. I'll quote 3, 5. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Verse 6. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. I would say that it is important, vitally important for believers to behold the kindness and severity of God. Both. Romans 11.22 Now as believers, to note this, we're not fearful of God's wrath. It's fallen upon another one. By God's grace. We're not fearful of God's wrath, but we're fearful of the Lord's rod. At least I am. And I think we should be. Remember what John Newton said, and you sing it. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." You see, we're going to find that there's two different types of fears. One of them is, is wrong for us to commit, and the other is, is definitely right for us to engage in. And note what he says in verse 20. Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Jeff, I thought you told us it's good to fear. Well, this is the negative fear we're speaking of. And one of the reasons he will tell them don't fear is because they are repentant. They are repentant. They realize their great wickedness. And the first thing he says to them is don't fear. And by the way, I really see this as a pattern throughout Scripture. Whenever God's people fall before the Lord in true contrition, humility, and repentance, the first thing He says is, don't fear. We even see this in the person of Peter in Christ. In Luke 5, uh, Jesus tells Peter, let's go fishing, in essence. And Peter's response, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. What's going on there? Peter's tired. He stayed up all night. It seems that he doesn't have the best attitude about obeying the Lord, but he's going to do it anyway. Not that he trusts Him, but he says, he doesn't say, I trust you. He says, because you said it, I'll do it. This is an act of obedience, not an act of trust and a good attitude. But note what happens. The Lord fills up their, their nets that they're breaking. And then Peter sees Jesus and he says, go away from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man. I think the Lord grants him repentance and he realizes, I haven't trusted him. I did this with a bad attitude. And yet the Lord is still gracing me with this. And what does Jesus say to him? Don't fear. Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. So we see this pattern throughout Scripture. And we see that Israel here is repentant which is amazing, but there's something really bad as well going on. They can't undo their sin. The period of the judges is over. The door is closed. It's locked. Now they have a king. They couldn't undo their sin. And the consequences are going to follow. This king will not be a godly king. But the point I think he's getting at is Samuel says, don't continue in your sin. Serve the Lord fully with your whole heart. And if you yourself have found your, yourself in this position of going, what I've done in the past, I cannot fix. I would give anything to go back and fix this. What do you do? I think the Bible's telling you. Start from where you are. Get back on the horse. Get back in the saddle and ride. Don't wallow in your guilt. Remind, let me tell you what. Reminding yourself of the past does not atone for your sins. It doesn't. That's been done. It's taken care of. You move forward. 
Verse 21 and 22, You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon His people on account of His great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make a people for Himself. First, he says, don't turn aside or you're going to go after futile things. The word there in the Hebrew, it means empty. It's worthless. It's going into a desert. Don't do that. You've got no, you're going to glean nothing from going down that path. So he says, basically, that, note this, it says, for the Lord will not abandon his people. Why won't he abandon his people? On account of his great name. Because the Lord has been pleased to make a people for Himself. You think the Lord doesn't abandon you because of His great love for you? That's, that's true, isn't it? I mean, that's true. I think so, uh, in His great mercy and love. But go a step back, can you? Go a step back and you see, ultimately, the Lord does this because of His great name. And He has chosen to make a name for Himself among us. In spite of us, he's done it. Isn't that great? The Lord cannot break his word. So that means that sin that you committed has not ruined your life. The Lord is using that sin and he's going to use it for your good and his glory. Verse 23, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. But I will instruct you in the good and right way. So he's looking at them and saying, I'm going to continue to instruct you. I'm going to continue to intercede. You see, Samuel knew a whole lot about intercession. And he knew that that was a vital, vital, important part of leading God's people. You know what's interesting? That same two-prong effect of interceding and, and uh, instructing are found in Acts 6-4. When it came down to the widows that were being overlooked in the daily distribution... You would think the elders would go full engaged in that and go, let's go ahead and take care of these people. They don't do it. They get some deacons that can handle it. And it says, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Primary responsibility of God's elders. They're engaged in it. They're doing it. Thankfully, it happens here. And that's awesome. Samuel said he wouldn't cease praying for them. Did you catch that? I'm not going to cease praying for you. That means he hasn't stopped. Even though they've been rebelling for so long now and they've removed him from office, taking an early retirement with no benefits. And yet Samuel still prays for them. But notice he says this, if I fail to pray for you, what am I doing? I'm sinning, not against you ultimately, but against the Lord. When the Bible says to pray for your enemies, listen to me. These were his enemies. They've become his enemies, and he's still going to pray for them. He goes, if I fail to pray for you, I'm sinning. I'm not going to do that. Don't we have it better today when you think of an intercessor? We don't have simply Samuel praying for us. We have the Lord Jesus Christ so much better. Romans 8, 34, Jesus Christ is he who died, yet rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. This very moment, we are anchored ladies and gentlemen, in heaven because the Lord Jesus Christ, He's continually praying for us. How much sweeter is that? Verse 24, Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things He has done for you. There's that word fear again. We'll come back to it. Um, let's go to the second part of that verse. Consider what great things He has done for you. Once again, there's this concept of remembering, uh, remembering, but also having gratitude. And I'm convinced gratitude leads to thankfulness. Thankfulness leads to loving and trusting the Lord. It really is a, it is a pattern we see. And not only that, don't we see in Luke 7, where Jesus um, tells the people regarding this woman that has come in and wept on his feet and dried with her tears, with her hair, some people have a problem with that. And Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Question. Who has been forgiven little in here? <laughs> yeah, see, the point is this. All of us have been forgiven much. 
And I think that's the point he's trying to make to the, the crowd there. All of you have been forgiven this much, so why is she the one that's doing this and you're not? Well, I think it must refer to the gratitude that she has for her sins forgiven. You see, we all have been forgiven much, but not many of us have that kind of gratitude. In verse 20, we found out earlier, he says not to fear. And now he says to fear. Which one is it? Well, let me give it to you even uh, more straight. Exodus 20, 20 uses the same phrase twice in different ways. He says this to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of Him may be set before you that you may not sin. So he says, don't fear, and you better hope that the fear of God comes before you. Which one is it? Well, it's the same verse, different meanings. I think what we're talking about is interesting. It's the same terms used in Hebrew and Greek. You just have to read them differently. And we know enough about this, right? Don't we have a sort of terrorizing fear that comes over us that is not from the Lord? Fear of tanks in the streets? Fear of uh, a breakdown of society? Terrorizing fear? Are those from the Lord? No. But we also have something called a beneficial fear. This is from God. Jeremiah 32 verse 40 says, I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. That is a beneficial fear fear. And that's the one we should embrace. I like what John Bunyan said, or said about this. He wrote a book called The Fear of God. It says, the more they are rightly in fear of the Lord's rod, the less they will come under them. For it is want of fear that brings us into sin, and it is sin that brings us into these afflictions. Think about perhaps when the time when you were a kid. I know as a child I had a healthy, beneficial fear of my parents. They loved me, and yet there was a fear I had. But in particular, the older I got, the more I began to fear my dad over my mom when I got to be taller than my mom and getting cocky. And, uh, but as a kid, I was incredibly forgetful. I still am, actually. I, I've had to work on this my whole life. Uh, I would forget my lunch, uh, my trumpet, my homework, my coat. I'd leave them at school. I'd leave them at the house. I mean, it was thrown everywhere. And uh, my parents both knew that if I continue to be this way, I will be a terrible adult and a terrible father and husband. You just can't live life this way. And so dad told me one day, he goes, you know, uh, keep in mind the next time you forget your coat, in particular, I was forgetting it over and over again. Next time you forget it at school, I'm going to discipline you. Well, you don't mess with my dad. His name is Rod. He used the rod very effectively, <laughs> and rightfully so. But I had a beneficial fear. It's for my benefit. It's for my good. It wasn't terrorizing. And so I think that's what he's saying here in verse 24. You need to fear the Lord. It is a little bit of knee knocking, yes. But you know he loves you. In verse 25, he says, But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. It's like he's saying, there's mercy today. There's plenty of it. But soon, you'll be swept away if you, don't, if you go back to this. If you're not staying repentant, if you're not staying trusting the Lord, following Him, you'll be swept away, which ultimately means exile. He had promised that from the very beginning. I will get you out of this land. I will spew you out if you do not obey me. So by way of application, there's much to learn from this text. And if the Spirit has given you applications in particular, go with them. But I'd like to mention a few things. Notice this. The people were accused. They were warned. They were encouraged. I'm going to flip those by way of application and say there's certain people here that need to be encouraged. You need to be encouraged. Those that dwell on their sins of the past, their mistakes, the things they did over and over and over again. I think you need to hear the scriptures, what they say through the prophet Samuel. Do not fear. You have committed all this evil. He doesn't back away from it. But he also says, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. We have something going for us that the Israelites did not. Many things. But one of them is Romans 8.28. They, they perhaps didn't fully grasp like we do today, that God really is working all things together for your good. Yea, even your sins, even your terrible, heinous sins. Be encouraged. 
Some need encouragement because you're fearful of the future. What's going to happen? Will the Lord take care of me? What about my past? Will that come up to haunt me again? And I would tell you the words of Scripture and the prophet Samuel. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things He has done for you. As you hold up this beneficial fear, there needs to be another one you hold in your other hand, and that is gratitude for all the Lord has done for you. Because only as you show gratitude, as you see it, and you're thankful of the Lord, all He's done, can you more trust Him. He is faithful when you consider it. Another group in here needs to be warned. Some here perhaps that are presently engaged in sin. Maybe you came here today as a favor for a friend. And presently you are going after futile things which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. Perhaps you are walking at a distance from Christ. You need to hear Jeremiah 2 that you need to not leave the fountain of living water because right now you're, bu you're busy hewing out cisterns for yourselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Let me tell you what, if you're trying to find wonderful tasting water in the world, it can't be found. It's not possible. The reason why, it's rigged. It's like going to the fair and shooting those baskets. Although some of you may have gotten it, okay? That's revealing. But many of these, they're rigged. And God has rigged the system. You cannot find your, your, your significance in the world. You can't. You can only find it in Christ. You're warned. Some of you are accused, or maybe I should use the word that Scripture uses. You're presently condemned. That means at this very moment, you're not in Christ. At this very moment, due to your sin, the Bible calls you an enemy of God in John 3. You're under His wrath. You will very soon be swept away into a punishment of eternal darkness. My encouragement to you today is run to the King of the universe. Repent and turn to Christ today. Your master will no longer be your sin, but, you will, but instead your next master will be the great shepherd of the sheep. He's calling sinners today. Come to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this passage. Thank You for Your grace uh, that caused our heart to fear and grace our fears relieved. Father, we pray for anybody in here that does not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Would You grant them faith and repentance today? Help them to believe to come to the Savior. And we'll thank you for what you're doing in our own lives. Pray for the saints that we, as we struggle along, that we might be able to seek your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all things will be granted to us as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. At this time, if y'all would please arise, and we will sing number 48, The Power of the Cross, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. We stand forgiven at the cross, hallelujah. We want to welcome, as uh, Seth already has, our visitors this morning. Uh, we're moving now into our observance of the Lord's Supper, and so we want to invite all those who belong to Him to partake with us. I'm going to read this morning from 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 21. So if you'd like to turn there, please do. In a number of ways, the establishment of the Lord's Supper by our Lord Jesus Christ was a, a forward-looking act. It was forward-looking in the sense that it pointed to an experience the Lord was to endure that was to take place in the very near future, which was His actual suffering on the cross. We stand forgiven in the cross it was forward-looking also in that he gave instructions for the supper to be commemorated by his followers in the ensuing years. Uh, that's what we're doing. That's indicated by the durative sense of his instruction to his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. And, you know, we often uh, translate that as this be doing in remembrance of me. And it was forward-looking because it symbolized a covenant of redemption planned in eternity past, foreshadowed by an old covenant sacrificial system 
uh, verbally prophesied by God's inspired prophets, but now brought to fulfillment by the Son, uh, bearing the curse of sin upon himself by the sacrifice of himself. And we can see and even feel that movement forward to fulfillment in the Apostle Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in 21. You have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he offered no, uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. We celebrate that today. It's the moment for that. By virtue of his redemptive work in the past, we today have a sure guardian and shepherd of our souls. That word guardian in my version, the same word we find often translated overseer or bishop. He is our supreme overseer, presiding even today over this supper, which we will now observe in the manner that he instructed us. So if you're here, as I said a moment ago, with us or watching on the live stream broadcast, and you know by faith that the Lord Jesus Christ bore your sins in his body on the cross so that you might die to sin, and live to righteousness, then please join with us in remembering him in this way, remembering now as we partake of the bread that he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, he said, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have. Uh, Jeff just mentioned uh, there is an assurance in that passage. There's also a warning. And we thank you that uh, by faith, uh, God has, you have given us uh, this great gift uh, to heed the warning and trust in a Savior who gave his body for us. And we understand what that means uh, by giving his body, not just that he died, though he certainly did, but that uh, he gave himself to bear the penalty for our sin in his body, uh, to feel uh, the rejection, the holy wrath of a holy God against him. Though he knew no sin, you made him sin on our behalf. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Please turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. to echo what Mark said, Lord's Supper is a time we enjoy the gift the Lord has given us, a reminder of what he has done. As I heard one man say, it is not only by grace alone that we become God's people, but by grace alone we remain his people. I believe that's true. Titus 2, verse 11 through 15, you're going to see one of these verses that sounds eerily similar to 1 Samuel 12, 22, and that's on purpose because it was written by the Spirit. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to, not, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And that's what we're doing today. It's reminding us once again why Christ came, why he gave his life, 
That verse that might have seemed eerily similar is Titus 2.14. He gave himself for us to redeem every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Compare that to 1 Samuel 12.22. The Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name because the Lord has been pleased to make a people for himself. Are you one of those? Are you of the group of people the Lord has made for Himself? If so, then I would encourage you to drink with us today from the cup of His blood poured out for your salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the blood and the bread. The wine and the cup, Father, ultimately they're symbols that we can see the glory of Christ. You give us these visual aids to enjoy week in and week out. Lord, help us to see today what great sinners we are and yet what a great Savior we have. And because we have such a great Savior, we too are also not just sinners, but saints in the body of Christ. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. You're dismissed.